It's indeed inspiring and beautiful. And allows us to begin this evening in a very uh, inspired way. Um, so it's great to be back at the park, right? It's such a wonderful facility. Right? Such a wonderful facility, and now an officially recognized Florida Heritage Site. Yeah. So it's my honor to recognize Vice Mayor Steve Glassman and the commissioners. So, uh, Vice Mayor Steve Glassman, please stand. And Commissioner John Burks, Pamela Beasley Pittman, and Dr. Warren Stern. Thank you so much. I'd also like to introduce our acting city manager, Susan Grant, our city attorney, Tom Ansborough. City, our city clerk David Sullivan, and our city auditor Pat Ryder. Let's give them all a round of applause for their amazing dedication and hard work. Thank you. Please be seated. So let's also take a moment before we begin uh, tonight's uh, program to remember the tragic loss of life and property of those across the South as a result of hurricanes Helene and Milton. Our emergency responders and public works crews put in long hours to make sure we were ready for Milton, but thankfully, we were brushed off by the very outer edge of these storms. But some of our rescue personnel have already headed upstate, rendering assistance, and we thank them for their service. In 2020, 2024 has been a year of remarkable progress for the city of Fort Lauderdale. So here's just some of the excitement that we'll discuss in more detail tonight. Beginning in January, we broke, the, we broke ground on the construction of the new water treatment plant. Now, as we near the end of the year, we are opening the renovated War Memorial Auditorium through a partnership with the Florida Panthers. Did you all get to go see it? Was it amazing? Soon, we will open the new Las Olas Marina. And on October 18th, we'll be, unveil our completely transformed DC Alexander Park. You know, too often we pause, or I should say we don't pause, and recognize the extraordinary successes that we have made this past year. The accomplishments can become lost among the very busyness of everyone's lives and schedules, and they don't fit the current mold of media sensationalism. And sometimes they unfairly fall victim to the increasingly divisive world of gotcha politics. So let's celebrate the improvements that have occurred over the past year, and the accelerated pace at which we have challenged ourselves in accomplishing the goals that we need to. We are FTL, right? Yeah. And we have become known as a can-do community, so let's keep up the great work and the tremendous progress that we have already started to make. Now, did you know that in the past six years, we've committed, committed an investment of more than $1.6 billion directly to infrastructure upgrades? We listen to our neighbors, our utility systems, and flood controls are rapidly being modernized to bring the best level of service possible to our neighborhoods and our businesses. In fact, in just the past 12 months, since the last State of the City address, we have launched more than $321 million in water and sewer improvements and $70 million in stormwater improvements alone. That's amazing. These are serious investments. These are serious investments to deal with serious challenges. Challenges will meet and beat. And did you know that Fort Lauderdale has led the way in addressing home affordability and homelessness? Or that, or that our efforts to maintain clean waterways surpass any nearby community? It's true. Also, we've added more police officers and firefighters and are paying them good salaries to, to their, for their deserving dedication to our city and to keep them on the job. Let's give a hand to all of our first responders. And get this, we accomplished all of this without increasing the millage rate in our taxes, now going on 18 consecutive years. Thank you very much, City Commission. Thank you, City Staff, for making this happen. So when I meet with municipal leaders from around the country, I'm often asked what our secret is. Almost every major city faces the problem of aging infrastructure. But we have additional problems. We are a coastal community, remember that, impacted by climate change. And we are part of a state that is attracting a thousand new people every single day. No, we can't put up barricades around our state and tell people to stop moving there. 
We've been successful because we shared a vision for our community. We have also shared that vision with neighbors and businesses who care and get involved. You've helped chart this forward-looking course for Fort Lauderdale, and we have had a dedicated city staff and private partners who've expedited the work and helped find the best solutions, getting projects done faster than anyone thought possible. Let me delve into some of the details with you, just to give you an example, starting with infrastructure. It's hard to say that anything is more important to a community than a solid, dependable infrastructure. The ability to deliver clean water, dispose of sewage, and prevent flooding, those are priorities for any city. Not so long ago, Fort Lauderdale neglected its infrastructure and diverted money from water and sewer reserves to pay for other needs. We put an end to those practices, as you all know. Now we're turning the corner, ensuring that we have the infrastructure that, that meets the demands of a growing city well into the future and generations to come. At the State of the City a year ago, I announced Fortify Lauderdale, an ambitious plan to accelerate stormwater projects across the city. That's on top of the work to improve our water and sewer systems. Fort Lauderdale's stormwater system was largely built in the 1960s and 1970s. It was designed to accommodate about three inches of water over a period of 24 hours. Well, we know that's not gonna work today, right? Large portions of the city were totally dependent on water percolating into the ground and lacked any strategic drainage. And that's no longer acceptable. We are increasingly targeted by intense storms, storms which we're only supposed to see once in a thousand years. Under our new design standards, our stormwater systems are des designed to handle up to 10 inches of water for every 24 hour period. That's more than tripling the, the system capacity. Projects include a wide variety of infrastructure features, more catch basins and connected underground pipes, larger pipes, tighter tidal control valves, pollution control baffles, water quality devices, enhanced swales, pump stations, and better seawalls. Hey, a lot of attention is focused on the low-lying neighborhoods that endured heavy flooding in April of 2023. We took immediate action and now are working on the future. When water rose up on the walls of people's homes and many houses had to be abandoned, we acted quickly. We brought to bear the resources of the county, the state, and the federal government to help the folks most in need. FEMA wrote checks to those who had no place to live and no funds to rebuild. That took direct, bold action. I got on a plane and I personally met with the White House officials <clears throat> to make sure our community was prioritized. We got the attention, the resources, and the manpower needed right then and there, not weeks and not months later. I remain deeply grateful to the state and federal government officials who swiftly answered our requests and gave us the needed help. And now we're working on the future Improvements in Edgewood, Edgewood River Oaks are, are substantially complete, an investment of more than $56 million. Underground systems in River Oaks have been updated, and the completion of the new pump stations will occur hopefully within 60 days. But let's talk about Osceola Creek, which overflowed surrounding all the surrounding neighborhoods, has been dredged to reduce the flooding risk, but still more work needs to be done to ensure the creek does not flood in the future and again threaten the nearby residents. At this point, I call upon Broward County, our partners, to improve the drainage system at the International Airport. And I also call upon the state to redirect drainage off of I-595, rather than flood into these neighborhoods, which impacted them severely. It needs to be done. Another $46 million in construction is going on in the Duras and Dorsey Riverbed neighborhoods and will be completed in the next year. The replacement of six seawalls in the southeastern isles is substantially complete. Over the next 12 months, we will go out on bid for upgrading stormwater systems in Progressive Village, the Southeast Isles, and Victoria Park. While we, while we complete the design engineering of capacity, improvements in Melrose, Manors, and Riverland. As part of Fortify Lauderdale, initiatives are taking place as we speak. We've started initial work on a second set of neighborhoods and are fast-tracking the plans through design. And that takes us not just through design, but permitting and construction. And once completed, this initiative will provide a majority of the city, including our most flood-prone neighborhoods, with significant stormwater capacity upgrades. I know that the design and construction of these projects can seem frustratingly long, particularly when you don't know what tomorrow's weather will bring. 
In that regard, our city public works department has stepped up its disaster preparedness strategies to respond faster and more efficiently. We've been tested twice this year. The June storm that dumped nine inches of rain in 24 hours and last week's Hurricane Milton. Our public works crews flew into action both times to protect our community. The identified issues deployed resources, including temporary pumps and vacuum trucks, to protect our most vulnerable neighborhoods. The new pumps proved effective in supporting our response. We are moving as fast as possible and have reversed the attitude of indifference to a can-do momentum. And we can do it, making us one of the most resilient coastal cities in the nation. And I'm very proud of our Public Works Department and everybody who's made that happen. So let's give them all a round of applause. For this. Our water and sewer systems also continue to undergo major upgrades. Since I became mayor six years ago, the city has constructed more than 19 miles of water pipe and 17 miles of sewer drain. The city is also boosting sewer capacity by better preventing the, inf the infiltration of stormwater runoff and groundwater into the pipes. At the beginning of the year, we broke ground on one of the most significant components of our effort to upgrade our utility infrastructure the construction of the Prospect Lake Clean Water Center to replace the aging and outdated Five Ash Water Treatment Plant. This state-of-the-art facility will provide clean, clear, high water, excuse me, high quality drinking water to our community for some generations. This is an amazing feat for any city to have done, and you talk to cities around the country and they look to us for the initiative and the ambition that we have taken. To be more clear, no longer will any resident have discolored drinking water. Yeah. It's time, and we're getting it done, finally. Yeah. And also, with all these hurricanes, it's being designed to withstand the Category 5 hurricane. A lot of water treatment plants, including 5 Ash, would not have withstood a significant storm. It will also remove contaminants that health experts and scientists have become increasingly concerned about. We're talking about the PFAS and other toxic forever chemicals. And Prospect Lake is another great example of how the city has leveraged innovative public-private partnerships. We've teamed up with companies that have international expertise in water uh, plant construction and the management. In addition to building the plant, they will operate it under strict city supervision for the next 30 years. We expect construction to be completed within the next 36 months. In fact, we are already a third of the way there. That's amazing. Another major improvement underway is the replacement of more than 58,000 old water meters. Finally, we're getting new water meters, everybody. With modern solid state technology. These meters will become more accurate and will provide customers the ability to monitor and control their water consumption. And if there's a leak or some other anomaly, we will know immediately instead of having to wait till next month's meter reading to figure it out. So as important as infrastructure is, so is the safety of our community. We have made strong strides in improving our police, fire, and EMS services. Public safety has been a huge concern nationally, but did you know that serious violent crime has actually gone down in our city? According to our police department, there has been an 8% decrease in robbery and a 28% decrease in homicides over the past five years. Amazing. We've added 37 sworn police officers to the ranks and 47 firefighters in that time span. Within the 2025 budget, which we just passed, we fund an innovative recruitment program in the police department to assist in, with filling these vacant positions. And with the additional firefighters, we can deploy more three-person rescue units to increase EMS coverage. This past month alone, we had some really good news about public safety from two of our members of Congress. Representatives Jared Moskowitz and Sheila Schiff and Liz McCormick announced that they had secured for Fort Lauderdale an $11.4 million grant for fire rescue. This funding will support the hiring of 28 more firefighters. That's on top of the personnel additions we've already made on our own. This is a significant investment in the safety and well-being of our community, and according to the fire chief, these additional firefighters will improve the department's level of service and ensure higher survivability of our patients. Thank you very, very much, congresspeople. Thank you for your efforts. In thanking both the both congresspeople, 
we have to also thank the, the firefighters and the, uh, the folks that helped make this uh, application for the grant a success. So it was a team effort. As we continue, the budget also finds a pilot program to use new technology to catch speeders in school zones, finally. We want our children to be safe as possible as they go to and from school. Every corner of our city should feel safe, and we are determined to end a rash of shootings in our Northwest neighborhoods. I'm pleased that our new police chief, Bill Schultz, is taking aggressive action to end this unacceptable level of gun violence. He has organized the department to prioritize this fight. A new gun intelligence unit works alongside other divisions in employing cutting edge tools, including the shot spotter gunshot detection system, as they seek to bring this evil to an end. But just keep in mind one thing. The only way we're gonna be successful in ending gun violence is if you know something, say something. We need the help of the public to help the police department get to these villains who continue to come to our community and, and engage in opportuni opportunistic acts of violence. We cannot stand for this any further and reach out to every member of our community to ensure the safety of our neighborhoods and our kids. On top of that, the Chief is also launching new partnerships to tap knowledge in violence, interruption, and intervention. These groups work to build community relationships and intervene before young individuals engage in crime and our police department is building better bonds with our residents. As a result of our participation in the leadership program run by the Kennedy School at, uh, at Harvard University and the former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg's charitable foundation, the city has been working on an initiative on improving the public's perception of safety and making it a reality. This, uh, I'm proud of our police department and the men and women who work very hard every day to protect our families and our property. They will, and, Guess what? They're soon going to have a new home. Have you been by there yet? It looks great. Construction of our new police station is well underway and will be completed next year. There were flaws in the design, and we anticipate that they'll be fixed, and they'll be fixed soon, and they'll be fixed at their own expense, not ours. And we'll soon have a safe facility, one that will also be able to withstand serious category four and five hurricanes, which today the existing facility would never have been able to withstand. The new facility will meet modern public safety needs with updated technology and better access to training. The old headquarters was 60 years old and was considered obsolete. I can't wait to cut the ribbon on this new building, the long, long, long waited improvement. Our response capabilities and fires rescue have continued to improve as well. Fire Station 13 on the Barrier Island has relocated to a temporary home, while a new station is built next to Birch State Park. A new Station 88, serving Rio Vista and other areas south of the New River, is entering the design stage, so work is set to begin early in 2025 on Station 117, just off of Los Olas Boulevard. So any discussion of public safety is not complete without addressing the problem of homelessness. No one can can look around South Florida and not be concerned. The city has worked for years to deal with homelessness compassionately by identifying housing options and enhancing opportunities to help those who are less fortunate of our society overcome the underlying reasons for their situation. But frankly, we have gone much further in our efforts than any surrounding community. But we are at a crossroads where public health and safety are being impacted negatively despite our best efforts. Last year alone, the police department and the fire rescue responded to more than 11,200 calls related to homelessness. I share the public's frustration with the aggressive panhandling and the number of people camping on the streets and bus benches, outside of businesses and on the beach. No one wants to criminalize homelessness, but a get-touch-tough get, uh, get approach is the only way we're going to be able to resolve this. The city of Fort Lauderdale has made substantial progress on bold new initiative in recent weeks. The state has mandated municipalities across Florida to become more assertive in dealing with the national crisis, and we are determined to lead the way here in Broward County. Good. Let it, yes. <laughs> let it be known, 
let it be known that we will help those who want help, but we will not tolerate behavior that harms our overall community and threatens neighbors and businesses. So our approach combines an elevated effort to provide assistance with an increased power of law enforcement. Along these lines, we have passed new ordinances prohibiting aggressive panhandling and, and camping on public property. In fact, our new ordinances are tougher than the state, uh, state statute that was recently passed. The legislature wanted overnight camping banned, but our regulation is not just overnight camping, but 24-7. Our approach is common sense. If there's something, something is a problem over, overnight, it is the same problem during the day. It's not that we're looking for conflict, but if people disobey and reject offers of assistance, we have to use all options available to, uh, to ensure the safeguard of our community. Homelessness should not be a lifestyle option in the city of Fort Lauderdale or anywhere. We're there to help, and we need, to, we need cooperation from homeless individuals to participate in these programs. We're reaching out, and we expect, we want everyone to be part of this effort. Even then, our goal would be to get them the needed help after they've been detained. A key part of this is the expansion of our current community court program. Community court is where homeless individuals are cited with minor offenses, can be diverted from the normal legal process, and, and receive critical social services such as mental health assistance or substance abuse treatment. It also avoids their having a criminal record, something that would otherwise plague them as they seek gainful employment so keep that in mind, it's a big difference. And these city ordinances are there to, uh, to cite uh, violators, not criminalize them. As part, as part of our new initiative, we are discussing the opening of a full service homeless assistance center to help coordinate this effort. And we are leading discussions with the county, nonprofits, and religious organizations about to increase the amount of shelter space as soon as possible. There are only 620 shelter beds available countywide. But when the county last took account, there were 2,487 homeless individuals in the county. And this homelessness is not just a Fort Lauderdale problem. It's a Miramar problem, Sunrise problem, Water Hill problem. It's a problem for all 31 cities in Broward. We must come together and do better. Regret regrettably, we bear the larger burden than other communities. Why is that the case? Well, we're the county seat. We're the home to the main jail and the main hospital. So homeless people from throughout the area are discharged onto our streets regardless of where they came from. We must put an end to that process now. Right. When homeless are discharged from the hospital or the jail, they should, there should be ways to ensure they return to the point of origin rather than land in Fort Lauderdale streets and neighborhoods. Make no mistake about it, we're going to get it done. And when I came into the office of mayor, one of our first actions was to close the homeless encampment in front of the county library. We got it done, we got it done then, and we'll get it done now. We are up to the challenge. With tenacity and determination, we'll make sure our streets are safer than ever. So I want to thank everybody working in our, in our community and working with our staff to ensure that these, that this, these programs are successful. We even hired a special individual, uh, Chris Cooper, who is now going to be our homeless chief, who is going to organize all of these services that we have. So give it up to these people. They're doing it. <laughs> our motto has long been that Fort Lauderdale is a great place to live, work, and play. What we have to offer residents and visitors is obviously truly remarkable. We are far, far, <clears throat> far more than just our beaches and our warm weather. We are becoming known around the world as a cosmopolitan community that has so many amazing things to enjoy. We started with the construction of our soccer complex with the Inter-Miami professional soccer team. The stadium was built at no cost to the taxpayers and is now owned by the city. The project included not just the stadium and the facilities for the team, a youth soccer academy and a football field for two of our high schools, all funded by the team itself. Construction will soon begin on an adjacent city park, a dog area, playing fields, and a community center. We are finishing the design as we speak. Then came our reconstruction of our world-renowned aquatic center and its new iconic dive tower. 
It is the tallest regulation tower in this hemisphere. Best of all, the center is open to the public seven days a week. While I might take a dip in the pool, I'll leave it up to you to go to the tower. <laughs> uh, I'm not as daring. <laughs> now, look at what has occurred the past year beyond those signature projects. We've entered an agreement with the Orange Bowl Committee to upgrade the, uh, Everett, excuse, the Jimmy Everett Tennis Center in Holiday Park. And I see Jack Sauer sitting here in the front row. And thank you, Jack, for participating and making that happen. Their financial support, combined with money from our Parks Bond program, will build a stadium court with seating, upgrade other tennis courts, install LED lighting, and add an electronic scoreboard. So it's an amazing contribution. I really want to thank the Orange Bowl folks and uh, all the other nonprofits who are participating in this. The next phase of the Aquatic Center renovation is set to begin. A new International Swimming Hall of Fame Museum will, will complement the award-winning world-class Aquatic Center and they will, they will, these facilities will bookend the existing pools on that peninsula. It'll be stunning. Construction is almost complete on a major pickleball center in response to the sport's growing popularity. The center will feature... Feature 43 professional courts and a dedicated pickleball stadium, along with a fitness recovery center, locker rooms, pro shop, 14 weatherproof courts for casual and competitive play. It's also going to reclaim a once abandoned water filled rock pit to create a beach for recreation as well as a beautiful restaurant. The place will be amazing. The project's being built out of an unused portion of Snyder Park, bordered by Interstate 595. It's not in Thank you. You're welcome. The center is almost finished, but it is being completely financed with no use of tax dollars. And of course, there, there is there is where <laughs> And speaking of private investment in our community, we have the, the place we just went to tonight at tonight's reception, the War Memorial Auditorium and the adjacent Baptist Health Iceplex. We opened the Iceplex earlier this year and soon we'll have the official grand opening of the War Memorial. Tonight we had a sneak peek, but these major undertakings came about through a unique arrangement with the Florida Panthers hockey team. The Panthers built the Iceplex to house their training facility along with two ice rinks that are available to the public. Since the start of the summer, the popularity of the center has been beyond our imagination. Hundreds of kids and families have come to skate and participate in the amateur hockey leagues. It's also where I saw Game 7 of the Stanley Cup. Were you there? Yes. We were both there. Because we're too cheap to buy a ticket. That's what it was. <laughs> As phase two, the Panthers transformed the 70-year-old War Memorial Auditorium into a state-of-the-art event and performance space. I cannot believe what they did there. I hope you all saw it tonight, did you? I hope you did. They did an incredible job remaking one of our iconic gathering spaces and giving it new life and new purpose. In many ways, it surpasses the original luster. It will be the home of graduations and concerts and garden shows and other family-friendly programming for decades to come. And yes, the Orchid Show is coming back. So just as important is the cost of operating the building. In the past, the city was hemorrhaging almost a million dollars a year to operate the building. Now the Panthers and Live Nation will run the facility and bear all the costs. All in all, the city has leveraged its real estate assets and by joining with private partners, our community is now the beneficiary. Get this more than a third of a billion dollars worth of improvements that children and families will be able to enjoy for generations to come. Isn't that incredible progress for our community? <laughs> Who would have imagined that 10 years ago that Fort Lauderdale would be the place where Leo Messi and a team owned by David Beckham would make the Major League Soccer playoffs and where the Florida Panthers would celebrate their first ever Stanley Cup victory? Right here in our backyard. Let's just, take a, let's just take 
for that and let's see a short video of that one for moment. Alexander Park will shortly be unveiled. With the assistance of world-class designers and an amazing construction team, the park will host an iconic structure that is intended to be an observatory overlooking our beautiful beach. Let me tell you, it will be a real head turn. Construction has commenced also at the reimagination of the Heisinger Park downtown. This, this, will, this will be a distinctive gathering place used to use from morning through the evening. There will be a civic lawn, a picturesque fountain, terraces, and a river overlook. There will be a new fine dining restaurant, adding to the city's growing reputation as a center of great cuisine. So I want to thank the DDA for partnering with the city for making this happen. It's going to be an amazing focal point in our downtown. We hope so. They're also adding 230 new canopy trees to the site, flowering trees, palms, 58 new species, of more than 13,500 new plants that will be uh, installed in that site. That's tripling the amount of the natural shade that we already have. This project celebrates the legacy of Wayne and Marty Heisinger, as well as the generations of community leaders that set the stage for downtown's renaissance. Heisinger Park, reimagined, will be downtown's signature park for everyone forever. Through the Parks Bond program that voters approved in 2019, we have already upgraded many parks citywide. Bond improvements in 47 other parks are in various stages of design, permitting, and construction. We also purchased land to add parks in the Bell Harbor neighborhood, Sailboat Bend neighborhoods, and I'm proud to report that we have now successfully negotiated the reopening of the Dottie Mancini Park with Broward Buses. Very proud of our park system and our and the folks that work in our Parks and Recreation Department for keeping them up and make, making them friendly and user friendly to everybody who, who comes to our city as well as our residents. So while we add all these new amenities, we cannot lose sight of what has always made Fort Lauderdale special, which is its environment. We are the Venice of America and are known around the world for our beautiful waterways. Our tourism advertising talks about vacation paradise from sawgrass and seagrass. We have to do our utmost to be the best environmental stewards that we can possibly be. Did you know that Fort Lauderdale earned national recognition this past year for its environmental practices and was honored by the, with the LEED Gold Certification? Very proud of that. In fact, we have put in place the most aggressive waterway cleanup program of any city in the region. Using a boat that operates five days a week, we service our 165 miles of waterways every single month. We are going even further. Beginning this new budget year, we have signed a contract with a stated target of removing 50% more debris and hitting hotspot areas every two weeks. Among our recent environmental accomplishments are implementing the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System requirements, expanding our weekly water quality monitoring to 12 locations, dredging the Hemershee Canal, and adding six new water quality structures in critical locations. We have also funded a Chief Waterways Officer who will coordinate our efforts to maintain and improve this precious part of our environment. Very proud of these efforts. Thank you, staff. Thank you so much. But there's more to come. When it comes to our beloved tree canopy, we have been recognized by Tree City USA for 43 years for our commitment to community forestry and have obtained the Tree City USA Growth Award nine times. We just passed, 
We just passed an ordinance to better preserve our canopy, and I have challenged us to plant 10,000 net new trees over the next decade, and we are well on our way. At our executive airport, we have committed a plan to reduce lead emissions, and the city has set a goal to achieve net zero on greenhouse emissions, becoming a truly sustainable city. Just as important as our environment is the preservation of our neighborhoods. Even as the city grows and matures, we must maintain the great feeling of community that we have in all of our neighborhoods. Our neighborhoods bring people and families together into quiet, peaceful environments. These offers, uh, excuse me, each offers its unique characteristic and history. Don't we all love our, we just love our community neighborhoods. We walk them, we see them, and we appreciate them. This year, we ensured our neighborhoods were protected from the pro uh, prospect of unregulated vacation rentals. We helped lead the fight. We helped lead the fight to Tallahassee to persuade the governor to reject a controversial piece of legislation. I signed a letter asking him not to sign that piece of legislation. It was very important to preserve what little regulation we have. If it had become law, the city would have lost the little authority that we already had. The city must be able to impose sensible regulations to protect year round residents from party houses. So the city commission. City Commission will soon vote on new regulations to better protect people from the impact of loud music and other amplified sound from nearby residential and commercial settings. We are determined to strengthen these requirements as residents have asked. We've approved the Strategic Historic Preservation Plan, one state aid to approve Breakers Avenue, are working on safety improvements on Galt Mile Street, and are collaborating with the state and county to add new crosswalks downtown. We've upgraded the streetscape along State Road A1A and the Central Beach. We're also adding dozens of new streetlights around the city. In conjunction with residents living there, those who came up with the money, we have completed the undergrounding of utility lines in the Los Olas Isles neighborhood. Finally! So what does this all mean? It means it is part of our effort to build a more resilient city and protect neighborhoods from the advent of climate change and more intense storms. Long Las Olas Boulevard, we are moving ahead with plans to beautify the corridor. And yes, we are committing, we are committed to ways of finding a, a, a path forward to incorporate the tree line median while improving the experience of customers. Yes. Shops. Yes. Finally, the city is working on a comprehensive plan to upgrade our sidewalks, and we're going to fund. We're going to find ways to fund this needed work. We've had many conversations with the commission. Walkability in our neighborhoods is important, and we will improve it. So let us now turn to a turn to a couple of challenges that we face as a city, starting with traffic and transportation. Traffic will always be a growing concern throughout any part of our city. Unfortunately, Fort Lauderdale is largely at the mercy of other governments that are in charge of our major thoroughfares and, high and highways and mass transit systems. As a city, we have made headway in improving transportation where possible. We worked with Broward County to undertake an upgrade of traffic signals and, syn and synchronization, with the county committing money from its transportation surtax for that kind of work. They plan to deploy new adaptive signal control technology that is more responsive to traffic conditions. Seven such projects are planned in Fort Lauderdale between now and 2026, including Broward Boulevard, Sunrise Boulevard, Commercial Boulevard, and Southeast 17th Street Causeway. In addition, the county is re-timing re traffic signals on key streets, including A1A and Federal Highway. That's great news. I'll believe it when I see it, Broward County. <laughs> well, let's hope we can get there and help to reduce traffic congestion. I'm sure you've all seen the new Convention Center Hotel, yeah, right? Yeah. Emerging out of the ground, this great monolith, amazing. The Convention Center is also expanding. It's truly a world-class project. So as part of the process, and at our, at, at our insistence, the county is building a bypass road through Port Everglades to make sure we don't inundate it with any more traffic on 17th Street. It's expected to open shortly before the hotel. And let there be no mistake about it. That road must be completed and operational before
before we allow the hotel to open. We will not be giving them the keys to that hotel until we see it, all right? In our downtown, we have reached the design stage of a concept for turning Andrews Avenue and Northeast Third Avenue into a loop of one-way street south of Sunrise Boulevard. Now, the original idea of that was that it could improve traffic flow and allow for the startup of a downtown trolley. But nothing's been approved, and we're still waiting for a neighborhood input on whether the project should move forward or not. We are working on multiple traffic calming projects, including one on Riverland Road and a major undertaking in South Middle River. We've expanded our Largo community shuttle operations, an easy, free, and convenient service for our residents and visitors. It's taking cars off the road. Of course, I cannot discuss transportation in our community without providing an update on the matter that I think is of utmost importance to the future of the city. And that is how the planned regional commuter rail system crosses through our downtown. Commuter rail is one of the few options available in making a major dent in congestion across the region. With connections between Miami and West Palm Beach, commuter rail can provide relief overwhelm north-south corridors such as I-95. It could be a real game changer, a long-term traffic solution offering easy access to the major ports and airports as well as city centers throughout the three counties. But as I've said for years, the real question is how the train system crosses the New River without harming our vitally important marine industry, increasing street level congestion, or reversing the great successes we have made in building our beautiful downtown. The county continues to want to build a high-rise bridge. The current plan is for a 48-foot high bridge for passenger service and two new water level bridges for the freight lines to travel on. But let's get real here. No matter how pretty they make it look, they will decimate the downtown, the beautiful renaissance that we have spent decades creating. It also will create a permanent wall between communities that for too long have been divided. I simply cannot believe their design. Hey, I'm no Pythagoras, but they say that a 48-foot bridge, the incline between Broward and a 48-foot bridge could be accomplished in a 3 to 4% incline. I find that a little hard to believe. Moreover, they would use, <clears throat> excuse me, they would use all of the existing railroad right of way. So some of our new residents who live downtown would have rail cars running inches away from their balconies. And our historic district will forget it. It would sit in the shadows of a concrete and steel overhang. We can do better than that, folks. So many trains would cross Broward Boulevard and other streets daily that traffic would come to an almost round the clock standstill. We're not talking about just Broward, we're talking about commercial boulevards, Sunrise. We need to think this thing through. So they say, oh, we'll build an underpass on, later on at Broward Boulevard. Later, when is that? They also don't include the cost of the new train station to, uh, of the commuter rail line. Why have there not been real price comparisons? All these new bridges, the underpass, the train station, how much does it all cost when you add everything up? And another problem. Let's say you build an underpass uh, for Broward Boulevard to go under the train tracks. We would have to shut Broward Boulevard down for two years. Imagine. And the marine industry. Well, I'm not sure if it would survive. The boat yards upriver have told us that they would have major difficulties servicing large boats if the bridge planned by the county is built. If they move their operations to other cities or other states, there goes thousands of jobs and billions in economic impact. Folks, we deserve better. Let's keep up the fight for the only real solution, and that is our time. Right? <laughs> the consequences of the choice between a tunnel and a bridge are too important for short-sighted, narrow-minded thinking. We can get it done, federal funding is available, members of Congress will help, and there are potential private partners out there who know how to do it. Just look to ourselves. The Port of Miami Tunnel was built ahead of schedule and less than its projected cost. If it can happen there, it can work here too. And we must stay committed to get this done. So another challenge we face as a city is the affordability of housing. As with traffic infrastructure and homelessness, this is a major problem for every city in our nation. I can tell you though that Fort Lauderdale has been a leader in, in South Florida in the creation of housing that is affordable to average workers and families. It's true. Even the county acknowledges that. In fact, we have built more affordable housing in the last six years than all the other cities in the county put together. 
we must, but we must maintain a diversity of housing. Teachers, nurses, bank tellers, waiters must be able to afford to live here and not have to grapple with hours, hour-long commutes that are distant suburbs. We want there to be a place where someone fresh from college can launch a career, as well as a place where a senior citizen can retire comfortably. The city has, the city has adopted new regulations that, moving forward, require developers who are building mixed-use projects to pay into a city fund with affordable housing or set aside a portion of the project for affordable housing. We have offered financial and development incentives to the creation of thousands of affordable housing units, among them the recently opened 7 on 7th, the Adderley, the Arcadian, Gallery at Fat Village, and Mount Hermon Apartments are all under construction, while the New Hope, Wright Dynasty, Alders, and Laramore projects are in permitting. In the past year, incentives have provided for other projects, including 1435 Art Exchange, a senior rental project by Homes Inc., and an affordable housing project by Habitat for Humanity. And one of the ways that Fort Lauderdale is leading is that we've created a, an innovative funding incentive to encourage workforce housing. One example is uh, Jeff Burns, the ERA project on South Andrews near Broward Health. It's a first of its kind partnership where we give tax breaks for the construction of affordable housing. We are the only city in the county offering this approach, and our housing authority is doing its part with the recent opening of Point Siena Cross, an amazing facility. You should take, you should go visit there. It's also working toward a new workforce housing project in Broadview Park on city-owned property there. In the next year, we will continue to look, we'll look for ways to utilize community redevelopment money to expand housing opportunities that are more affordable than market rate products under construction. We're also creating an affordable housing master plan. We can do this, and we need to provide more affordable housing for people to live in our community. <clears throat> so let me now turn to our robust and growing economy. We have been on an amazing trajectory of economic growth. Financial stability at the city, an expanding job base, preservation of our key industries, and the attraction of new businesses. This month is the start of the city's new fiscal year, and it represents the 18th consecutive year that the city has approved the budget without an increase in property tax rate, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> this has been an accomplishment while still meeting all the major community goals that we have discussed so far. Those include improving public safety, upgrading our infrastructure, an aggressive and proactive stance on homelessness, enhancing our environment, protecting the unique character of our neighborhoods. Hey, that's great news for families who struggle to make ends meet, and we're very happy to be the leader in this effort. In fact, Fort Lauderdale is the only city in Broward County that has been able to avoid a tax rate for this length of time. <clears throat> tax hike, excuse me. During the same period, the rates in the other municipalities have increased an average of 36%. We have been one of the lowest tax uh, uh, rated cities in the state for a city of our size. And during the past few years, we've implemented solid financial strategies that have allowed us to continue to upgrade our credit rating to triple A status. This allows the city to borrow money for infrastructure projects at lower interest rates. And one key element to allowing this is true was to one key element that allowed us for this to occur was the elimination of the deeply misguided policy of rating on water and sewer reserves to balance the budget. We stopped that and we are better off today. <laughs> Tourism. Let's talk about tourism. Tourism remains one of our cornerstones of our economy and it is booming. Ever since post-COVID, Fort Lauderdale is benefiting from the robust demand as the state overall is reporting some of the best tourism numbers in its history. We have a growing hotel inventory, not just down on the beach, but also downtown. Downtown Fort Lauderdale has tripled its supply of hotel rooms since 2018 and is positioned to add more including the ultra-luxury Whitfield that is now under construction. Soon, we'll be back to in the business of attracting national and inter international conventions. Convention planners everywhere are salivating over the soon-to-open expansion of the con Convention Center Hotel and its 101-room Omni Hotel late next year. Another cornerstone of our economy is the marine industry. We have taken significant steps to preserve and expand this business. For example, the city had been stuck with a horrible deal with the developers of the Bahia Mar and the Barrier Island. They had all the approvals necessary to pack the peninsula with apartment buildings. 
The future of the Fort Lauderdale International Bull Show with its annual impact of 1.3 billion was in serious doubt. The prestigious event, the largest outdoor boat show in the world, is being shoved into a parking garage over the objections of the organizers. Fortunately, we were able to sit down with the developers and come up with a much better plan. We cut the project in half, added a luxury hotel, and permanently created an open green space for the public where none existed previously. But most importantly, we secured the site as a permanent home for the boat show. We also established a revenue stream. We also established a revenue stream to help pay for city services for decades to come. We're going to be making a lot more money there than we did before. Almost a billion dollars in revenue will be coming to the city over the lifespan of this agreement. A billion. I was proud to open the first phase of the project with the commissioners, uh, and that occurred last month with the incredible Marina Village filled with a fabulous array of, of restaurants and boat for boaters and uh, beachgoers to choose from. Did anyone go to the Marina Village yet? It's an amazing place. Right? We're also about to cut the ribbon on a major upgrade of the Las Olas Marina. It's another example of how the city and the private sector can work together to bring about improved opportunities for economic development and exciting amenities for our community. More than seven years ago, we began discussing options with neighbors and leaders of our marine excuse me, of our maritime community. We believe the marina was underutilized and in need of a major facelift. New facilities doubles the dockage capacity, allowing more and larger vessels to dock there. There will also be restaurants and other features to attract yachters from around the world. We accomplish this by a unique plan to dredge out an old city parking lot, making room for this expansion. We will remain the center of the marine industry for yachters and decades to come, and we will not let anyone surpass us. We've been working hard to add another major industry to the mix of the local economy. I'm sure you've heard about this. Florida has been, uh, become the major destination for film and television production. Yeah. Right? But we lost some ground when the state took away some of their incentives. We've been fighting back, our way back to uh, trying to get the attention of those in Hollywood, and I think we're getting there. Just this past year, we surpassed the $80 million mark in film permits issued in our city in the past year. This remarkable achievement is the city's position with the industry so that we can attract more projects. The local economy has benefited through the creation of job opportunities for 2,825 local crew members. You know, these productions included Bad Boys, Ride or Die, and commercials for companies such as Volkswagen and Wells Fargo. It's amazing just what we've done so far. Soon a project will get underway that will accelerate our move into the media industry, taking us to the next level and, and, what, uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, and what we have to offer producers. Construction will begin next year on a large-scale, high-tech uh, content creation studio complex for movies, TV, streaming, gaming, esports, metaverse, and immersive experiences. It sounds like we're going to be we're going into the 21st century all, on all fours. The sound stages, film sets, set film sets attract, will attract even more film. Television and streaming productions as well as the latest immersive content. This facility will be developed by, on the old Wingate uh, Landfill Superfund site. The city cleaned up that property decades ago, but no one was ever interested in doing anything there until a group of entertainment executives stepped forward with a one-of-a-kind partnership offer. We announced earlier this year that the primary tenant will be Infinite, Infinite Reality, and that, will, and that company will create, at its current estimates, more than a thousand high-paying jobs. Those are jobs for young people, good jobs that will allow more of them to stay here rather than move away. And there will be jobs that will be uh, drawn from people who live in the community around the site, which is very, very important. And Infinite Reality also did one, one step more. They have announced a partnership with Google. Google, you've heard of Google? Yeah. <laughs> Google's tech, yeah, Google it. Uh, Google's tech will be part of the Infinite Reality Studio Campus Projects. It's an amazing opportunity for our city. The partnership joins together Google's Gemini AI with Infinite Reality's immersive technology to power a wide range of commercial content, both for both for commercial and entertainment. This is an incredible and exciting step forward for the movie studio project. 
The movie studio will now be at the forefront of rapidly developing use of technology and content creation. I fully expect that this will open the door for more tech and content creation firms to move to the region with good paying jobs as they take advantage of the presence of the Infinite Reality team and their relationship with Google technology. This is truly transformative for our city. Yeah. So talking about all right, so talking about transformative, what about our downtown? In the past year, downtown Fort Lauderdale has added over 3,200 jobs. Amazing. It's a 5% increase since 2023. This growth is impressive, something that most major downtowns yearn for. Having housing so close to workplaces downtown has lured companies to locate there and encouraged those that were already here to expand. Companies are looking at satisfying environments for employees. Downtown Fort Lauderdale has that, with its walkability, homes, office, restaurants, entertainment options, and retail shops. Yes, we have emerged out of the shadow of Miami and Palm Beach, and downtown is a family-friendly with its share of families with children higher than what you see in the urban core of other rising cities like Tampa, Nashville, Nashville and Austin. How many times do we see baby strollers going down, down the streets of Flagler Village? It's amazing. The number of children under five years old living in the large cities across the country has been declining in double digits, but not in Fort Lauderdale. One out of three families in our community have chosen to live downtown. The Northwest Sistrum area has also made tremendous progress through our efforts or through our Community Redevelopment Agency, our CRA. Not only is the new housing begin, uh, being built there, as I discussed earlier, but older homes have been re renovated and new commercial enterprises have opened. The YMCA is a significant addition, and we continue to add healthcare and education op options to that facility. But our work there is not complete. The CRA will soon sunset next year. We must find ways to continue to invest and finish the vision that we have spent so long on making into a reality. Extending the term of the CRA would be one such option. Friends, we have phenomenal progress on infrastructure, public safety, the environment, amenities, housing, and economic opportunities. Look at how the world envisions us. We're listed among the best cities to retire, the most fiscally fit cities, the best places to live in the top 18 hour cities, just to name a few of the recognitions. We are a vibrant, diverse, and growing city. And as I look around, I see a community brimming with pride and resilience and unparalleled spirit. Our city is not just a place on the map, it's a living, breathing entity driven by passion and dedication of its people. As we move forward, let us remember that the strength of Fort Lauderdale lies in its neighbors. As your mayor, alongside with my colleagues on the commission and our staff that work day in and day out tirelessly, we are committed to progress. We are committed to results, we are committed to providing the kind of leadership that gets things done. Together, we have overcome challenges, we have celebrated successes, and we have built a community that stands as a testament to our collective effort and determination. The road ahead is filled with opportunities. With our continued support and involvement, I am confident that we will achieve greater heights. So tonight, I just want to thank you for your unwavering commitment to our city, Together, we are shaping a Fort Lauderdale that will shine brightly for generations to come. This is an incredible and unique community. When we say we are FTL, this is an immense sense of pride in our city, our neighbors, our businesses, and our employees. Here's what we are. We are FTL. This is what it means to us. Let's pause a moment for our video. Fort Lauderdale a city that's more than just a place. It's a community, a spirit, a way of life. So what does it mean when we say we are FTL? Being FTL means keeping our community safe, day in and day out. Being FTL means growing together. Our businesses and our people thrive side by side. Front education and the future. That's what it means to me. Being FTL means community, where neighbors become friends and everyone feels welcome. It's taking pride in the little things, keeping our city clean and beautiful so everyone can it. It's about hard work and making sure our city shines every day. It means being active, connected, and supportive. The city looks out for us. 
No matter how we serve our neighbors or what part of this beautiful city we live in, we are all Fort Lauderdale, and that is what it means when we say we are FTL. in the journey ahead. So all I just right. want to take this moment from the bottom of my heart on behalf of the City Commission and our staff here in the, our city, thank you for coming tonight, for being part of this wonderful evening, and let's go out, walk, be safe, and be appreciative of all the wonderful things that life has given to all. So God bless America, God bless our troops, and thank you everyone for being here.